Thank you, Derek. What a lovely introduction. Um, it is, my name is Paige Swales, and I'm uh, a midwife and certified nurse midwife at Foothills Community um, Midwives Practice um, at Boulder Community Health. And it is a true honor to be here um, with Dr. Katherine Evans. Um, and we are um, delighted to be giving a presentation tonight on spotting all the signs of breast cancer. Um, so we'll be able to go through some slides, and I encourage all of you that are watching to um, post your questions, like Derek said, into the chat room, and that will allow us to be able to get to all those questions at the end of our presentation. And I just want to say thank you again for being online for this presentation. So why is breast cancer screening important? Um, breast cancer screening is most easily treated and most likely to be cured when caught early. Believe it or not, 13% of women born today will be diagnosed with breast cancer at some point in their lives, which to me is astonishing, but it's an incredible number and always important for us to remember that, especially as we get older and uh, we go to our appointments and we um, keep eye on ourselves and our health. It's always just important to keep that number in the back of your mind. Um, that really means one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. And women in the United States will get breast cancer more than any other type of cancer except skin. So one of the first things that I want to talk about today is just breast awareness. And what that really means is knowing your body, knowing your breast tissue, knowing what is normal for you. Um, what that means, that means knowing the size of your breast. Has anything changed? Uh, the shape of your breast, the texture or consistency. Um, also, the skin on your breast. A lot of people don't think of skin as being something that would um, be indicative of something abnormal going on with the breast tissue, but that is not true. So always be paying attention to the skin on your chest or your breast tissue is very important. Uh, nipple awareness and axillary awareness. Axillary is your underarm area, um, and so it's really important when you're assessing what is going on in your body to assess that area as, as well. Um, I'll go in detail more on that in just a moment. Um, the other thing is really important is to know your risk. And so consider risk screening, which is um, a couple different things. One, just your personal history. So personal and family, as well as considering hereditary cancer screenings. Um, and these are all things that are very individually based, and I encourage all of you to have a dialogue with your provider about this. That way, everything can be um, personalized and the best screening for you. Um, so signs that you should not ignore. Um, anything that is a change for your breast tissue would be something that I would reach out to your provider about, whether it's a change in the size of your breast, smaller, larger, asymmetrical, so maybe one is larger than the other, um, the shape of your breast, so if your breasts have always looked a certain way, and now, you know, months go by and you notice that something looks different, whether, again, it's asymmetrical or whether, um, you know, one side might have a bulge on it, anything like that is something that you would want to notify your provider. Um, any pain is the other thing. A lot of people just think pain might be they um, had some sort of trauma or accident or hurt, you know, uh, may, may have a bruise or from wearing their bras. Um, Anything that's any pain at all, I would at least reach out to your provider because that would indicate that you would um, want to probably come in and get a clinical breast exam by your provider. Um, the other thing would be nipple discharge. So other than breast milk, there should be no nipple discharge, and that's something that's absolutely worth looking into further. Um, and obviously any new lumps or lesions or masses um, that are in the breast or under your arm um, are definitely worth calling your provider and getting in to be seen. The thing that I do not have on this slide is um, skin changes. Um, it could be something as simple as a rash or a red area or um, dimpling of the skin or an area that feels more swollen or looks swollen. All of that, I would definitely make sure you call your provider. Um, I'm actually gonna go back really quick. So there is a little bit of discussion about doing self-breast exams. Um, do you do them, do you not do them? And one of the things that I just want to point out is um, 
the one of the ways that you know what is normal for you is by assessing your breast. So whether you call it a self-breast exam or not, knowing the size and shape and texture and the way your breasts look and feel is the most important way to know if there's something that is um, that has changed or that might be different. Um, and all of that warrants a call to your provider and an appointment to be seen. So clinical breast exam, that is something that would be done by one of your providers. Um, so that's something that you can come into the office. You can schedule an appointment for just a clinical breast exam. That is also something that that is included in your yearly well woman exam as well. Um, and so how often should these be done? A, you know, women ages 20 to 30, it can be done every year, um, sometimes up to every three. Um, and then women over 40 and over should really be having these every single year. And then um, there is an, a more appropriate time to have a clinical breast exam. It's most important if you do it the same time so if you're somebody that always comes in um, you know, in October, then we want to see you every October. If you're still getting normal regular cycles, we usually like you to do it the week after your period ends. Just that way your breasts are less tender and they're less textured. Um, and then that way it's consistent um, when you're getting your exams. So breast messages, awareness messages that I want you all to take home are things like know your risk look at your medical history, um, get screened, and then knowing your normal. So making sure that you do look at your breast and you do feel them and that you assess to see if there's any changes or anything different that you need to have evaluated by your provider. And then um, making healthy lifestyle choices. So when we talk about knowing your risk, what does knowing your risk really mean? Knowing your risk is knowing, is there any family history of breast cancer? Um, did my aunt have breast cancer? Did my grandmother have breast cancer? Those are all things that are really important for you to know in your family medical history. And so I think you know, having a conversation with both sides of your family to gather that information is really important. And then relaying that to the provider that you're seeing. Um, also, your personal history. Um, and then making sure that you have that dialogue and that you're seeing a provider that you feel comfortable with, that you are able to spend the time with to go over these risks. Um, so what are risks? Like what are risk factors? And then what can we do to help reduce risk? Um, so risk factors themselves do not cause breast cancer, um, but risk factors are associated with an increased chance of getting breast cancer. So what are, what are some of these risk factors? Some of these might be genetic, some things that can't be controlled. And other risk factors are things that, um, that can be changed, like lifestyle modifications. Um, and the two most common risk factors are things like being a female and aging. So as we get older, our risk definitely increases. So, as I mentioned, being female obviously is uh, the big risk factor. Though men do, males do get breast cancer, but being a female is definitely higher. Um, getting older, so again, as we age, the risk increases. Um, some inherited genetic mutations, that is essentially saying things that are um, hereditary, and so one of the things that we can consider would be hereditary cancer screenings. Um, some breast, some other breast diseases are things like lobular carcinoma in situ, which is not a cancer, but it is um, a, breast, a breast disease that would definitely increase your risk of breast cancer. So that would be something that you would want to relay to your provider and maybe increase screenings. Um, breast hyperplasia is another one of those. Uh, family history, so any family history of breast cancer, as well as any other female cancers, is important to know. Um, Dense breast, um, any dense breast tissue, women do tend to have a higher chance of breast cancer. Um, higher estrogen levels. Um, your own personal history, so like having a prior breast cancer or a ductal cancer, anything like that, that would be um, increasing risk. Some high bone density also would increase your risk. Um, menopausal hormonal use, that's really referring to things like 
um, hormone replacement therapy, and I think that those are great conversations that you should have with your provider about hormone replacement therapy. Um, not having any children or um, having a child after the age of 35 actually increases your risk. Um, being overweight, excessive alcohol use, um, early menarche before the age of 12, um, a sedentary lifestyle. And so now just a little bit about the genetics and breast cancer. Um, genetic mutations are spontaneous or they can be inherited. They have to start somewhere. So just because you don't have any history of a genetic or hereditary cancer doesn't mean that you might not carry that. So it is still important to consider that screening if it's right for you. Um, there are several inherited mutations that are strongly linked to breast cancer. The ones that are most commonly known are the BRCA1 and the BRCA2. Um, inherited mutations in the general public are 1 in 400 to 1 in 800. And this means about 5, five to 10 percent of breast cancer cases in the United States are hereditary. I encourage you all to check out um, this online assessment tool and to review these findings with your provider. And this is just an online assessment that you can do to determine your own risk for breast cancer. So how do you get screened? Um, first step is talking with your provider um, and knowing which tests are right for you. And depending on your personal history and all the risk factors that we just went over, um, the recommendations will be made at that time based on your personal risk. And then I know some of this might sound really redundant, but always continue to make healthy lifestyle choices. So maintaining a healthy weight, um, you know, being active and, in, and making sure that you're including exercise in your daily activities, um, limiting alcohol consumption, um, obviously breastfeeding if you can, um, and then limiting hormonal, uh, menopausal hormonal use. And that is just something, uh, the menopausal hormonal use, again, everything is case by case, and I think that there are benefits to that, but it is something that you should absolutely review with your provider. Thank you so much. I'm gonna give the mic over to Dr. Katherine Evans, and she's gonna go over more about the imaging and a little bit more of the medical side of breast cancer screening. Thank you so much, and I look forward to answering all of your questions. Hello, everyone. I'm Katherine Evans, and I just want to thank you all for having me here, and thank you to everyone who's joining us online. Um, as Derek mentioned in the introduction, I joined Boulder Radiologists um, in July of this year, and in my short time here, I've just been so encouraged by how proactive the Boulder community is in their health care and staying well-informed, and I hope to provide some useful information to you all tonight. So another look at breast cancer by the numbers. So in 2020, over 325,000 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. And an estimated 42,170 women will die from breast cancer this year alone. And surprisingly, 75% of women who get breast cancer are actually average risk with no family history of the disease or other high risk factors. So those are pretty sobering numbers. What's the good news? Well, we know that early detection saves lives. So since about 1989, um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives have been saved uh, by the combination of screening mammogram and new developments in uh, breast cancer treatment. And so as this graph shows here, up until like the late 1980s, um, when screening mammograms became widely, widely available, the breast cancer death rate was pretty constant. So starting yearly mammograms at the age of 40 has helped cut breast cancer deaths by more than 40%. And we know now that um, better outcomes are linked to um, early detection and screening. Mammograms can find tumors that are too small to be felt. Um, on average, uh, a mass that's felt is approximately two to two and a half centimeters, whereas these screening um, Imaging that we do can find cancers that are a centimeter to a centimeter and a half, and sometimes even smaller than that. 
Small cancers are also easier and less costly to treat and have a better chance for cure. So let's talk about the most current screening guidelines. So as radiologists, we follow the guidelines from the American College of Radiology and the Society of Breast Imaging, which recommends that women of average risk for breast cancer have yearly mammograms starting at the age of 40. Why the age of 40? Well, we know that one in six breast cancers are found in women ages 40 to 49. And as this uh, chart shows, breast cancer does increase in incidence by age. So we know that um, incidence is very low below the age of 30. It sort of moderately increases between the ages of 30 to 40. And then there's a steady increase from the ages of 40 to 75. And then it sort of dips down from there. Which brings us to the next question of when to stop screening. So the American College of Radiology believes that there's a potential benefit to screening mammography as long as a woman fits these three criteria. Um, she's in good health, is expected to live at least five to 10 years, and would seek treatment if a cancer is found. So as long as they fill this criteria and have that conversation with their provider, it's reasonable to continue with screening mammograms. So I'm just going to take a quick moment to talk about alternative screening guidelines because I know there's a lot of conflicting information out there and it can be a little bit confusing to sort through. So the American Cancer Society guidelines recommend that women start mammograms um, no later than the age of 45 and that anyone who wants to start a mammogram at the age of 40 should have ensured access to those screening mammograms. There's another organization called the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, um, the USPSTF. And they recommend that um, women ages 40 to 49 um, do not get routine mammograms. They recommend screening mammograms every other year for ages 50 to 74. Now, I just want to um, share that published analysis has shown that these guidelines would miss approximately a third of cancers. That means 6,500 to 10,000 additional breast cancer deaths that can um, be missed every year following these guidelines. And actually, the federal government has barred Medicare and private insurance companies from basing mammography coverage based on these, guide, based on these recommendations. So just to reiterate again, um, we believe that screening should start at the age of 40 for the average risk women. The most lives are saved from breast cancer when women are screened um, on an annual basis starting at the age of 40. And by not doing that, you do increase your risk your chances of dying for breast cancer, and also the likelihood that you'll experience more extensive treatments for any cancers that are actually found. So Paige did a great um, job talking about uh, risk assessment. And I think one thing that at least all organizations can agree on is the importance of risk assessment. All women should have some type of a risk assessment by the age of 30 to see if they're at increased risk for breast cancer, especially black and Jewish women who are known to have increased rates of mortality from breast cancer. Um, we follow um, uh, more closely the Tyra Cusick model. It's one type of a risk assessment model that has been shown to consistently um, estimate risk. And just so that you're familiar with this name, this is actually going to be something that's going to be um, in the future generated automatically on all ma uh, mammogram reports. It's the Tyra Cusick Risk Score. And it estimates the likelihood of a woman developing breast cancer in 10 years and over the course of her lifetime. So looking at all the risk factors um, that Paige touched on, age, body mass index, age at menarche, obstetric history, age at menopause, history of benign breast conditions that are known to be associated with increased risks of breast cancer like ADH, ALH, and LCIS, any history of ovarian cancer, use of hormone replacement therapy, and most importantly, family history. So this means histories of breast and ovarian cancers, any Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, and other genetic factors. So, Let's talk about high-risk screening guidelines. So just by being a woman, you're considered average risk. Um, but there is a category called high-risk um, screening that's a little bit different. And so if you have a calculated lifetime risk of breast cancer of greater than 20% based on one of these risk assessment models we talked about, you're considered high-risk. If you have a known genetic mutation, so BRCA1 or BRCA2, 
or even if you've never been tested um, genetic, you've never had genetic testing, and you um, have a first degree relative with a BRCA1 or BRCA2, you fall into this high risk category. There's a number of hereditary cancer syndromes that are also um, in the high risk category. Lynch syndrome, Lee Fraumeni, Cowden, and Putz Yeager is just to name a few. And also, any woman with a history of uh, radiation to the chest region before the age of 30. So this was sometimes um, with like Hodgkin's lymphoma or other childhood or young adult um, cancers where they receive radiation to the chest. Um, this would be another uh, category that falls into high risk. So if you are a high risk patient, um, your guidelines, screening guidelines are going to be different. Uh, you, should be beginning, you should be beginning annual screening mammography at the age of 30, but not before the age of 25. And generally, it's recommended that you begin screening about 10 years earlier than the age of diagnosis of a first-degree relative. So that means if you are in the high-risk category and your mother was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 37, ideally, you would begin screenings at the age of 27. And it's also recommended that women of high risk um, supplement their uh, mammographic screening with contrast-enhanced breast MRI. And that would be done on an, an annual basis. And um, the ideal schedule for that is that you would alternate with screening mammography. So every six months, you would be getting either an MRI or a mammogram. So in terms of breast MRI screening, um, aside from you know, that high-risk category that I just talked about, um, there are a few other uh, situations that would merit a screening breast MRI. If you have a personal history of breast cancer and dense breasts, that would be one reason. If you had breast cancer diagnosed before the age of 50, or if you've had a prior biopsy that showed atypia, so again, the atypical ductal hyperplasias, atypical lobular hyperplasias, or the lobular carcinoma in situ. And if for whatever reason um, a woman can't um, get a breast MRI, say they have a uh, severe allergy to the contrast medium, have an implanted device that's not compatible with MRI, or a number of other reasons, then uh, ultrasound should be considered in lieu of MRI. So I'm just going to take a moment now to talk about the different imaging, breast imaging services performed at Boulder Community Health. We offer digital screening and diagnostic mammography, including tomosynthesis, or so-called 3D mammography. We offer a screening whole breast ultrasound and diagnostic breast ultrasound. We offer a screening and diagnostic breast MRI and a number of image-guided procedures, which I won't get into today, but we do offer stereotactic ultrasound and MRI-guided breast um, biopsies. So I just want to make sure that everyone understands the difference between a screening and a diagnostic exam. It can be a little confusing, and uh, we use all three modalities, mammography, ultrasound, and MRI, for both these types of studies. So a screening study is performed in somebody who's completely asymptomatic. We're looking for hidden breast cancers that are basically too small to feel. Um, these studies are reviewed by the radiologist after the exam, and there's a standard report that's issued and usually sent to your provider. Now, a diagnostic exam is one that's performed in women who are experiencing some type of symptom, so breast pain, um, so a lump, uh, nipple discharge, skin changes, those would all be reasons to have a diagnostic exam. Um, diagnostic exams are also performed af as a follow-up to an abnormal screening mammogram. So say you get called back for a finding on a screening mammogram, that study then becomes converted to a diagnostic exam. These studies are done in real time. Um, they're reviewed by the radiologist um, during the time of exam with um, additional imaging that can be done immediately if needed. So I'm sure many of you have gone through um, a few screening mammograms by now, um, and I just want to uh, give you an overview of what to expect and the possible outcomes of a screening mammogram. So basically, out of every 100 women who get a screening mammogram, 90 will be told that their mammograms are normal, and C in a year will you know, continue with annual screenings. 10 of these uh, women will be asked to return for some type of additional diagnostic imaging, either by mammogram or ultrasound. 
six of those women will be reassured that their mammograms are normal. So it might just be benign overlapping tissue or a benign cyst, and they can return to screening mammograms at that point. Two of the 100 will be asked to return in six months to follow up on a finding. So this is what we call a probably benign finding, uh, where we ask to have you come back in six months to look at the finding and make sure everything looks stable. And two out of the 100 will be recommended for some type of a needle biopsy after their uh, diagnostic workup. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the different technologies that we use. Um, screening digital mammographies are bread and butter. It's basically using low-dose x-rays, uh, which are converted to digital images, which are then viewed by the radiologists on their computers. And for every screening um, mammogram, we take two standard views of each breast. They're called the medial lateral oblique view, which are the two images on the left, and the cranial caudal view, which are the two images on the right. And these are your standard four images for every screening mammogram. We also employ um, computer-aided detection. Um, it's called CAD. It's basically when the computer software searches for any abnormal areas of density, masses, calcifications um, that might indicate the presence of cancer. It highlights um, areas on the images and alerts the radiologist to sort of carefully assess these areas. I think of it kind of like a scout. It's bringing, um, you know, kind of highlighting all the, the possible um, uh, problem areas on the, on the mammogram, and then it's up to the radiologist to sort through that information and decide um, what's normal and what's not. So at Boulder Community Health, um, we, uh, every mammogram is done with, every screening mammogram is done with uh, digital tomosynthesis, or a 3D mammography. And this is when the x-ray tube um, sweeps in an arc over the breast and it takes multiple low-dose x-ray images and reconstructs those images into these really thin one-millimeter slices. And so as you can see on the image here, the, the image on the very left is a 2D image. And then the four images um, on the right are tomosynthesis images. So on the 2D images, you see some, you know, areas of white or fibroglandular tissue, as we call it, um, nothing really stands out. But once you start to parse that out into these little one millimeter slices, um, on the third image of the tomosynthesis images highlighted in the yellow box, you see an abnormal mass that sort of pops on that image. And so you can see how the use of tomosynthesis has um, uh, really sort of improved the um, the uh, accuracy of screening mammography. It improves cancer detection rates and it also decreases the need for callbacks and biopsies, which is really great. So diagnostic mammogram, once you um, are called back from a screening or you come in with a finding, um, diagnostic uh, mammography is performed. And this might include a number of different types of views. Um, one is called a spot compression view, where we use a smaller paddle to sort of compress um, a smaller area of tissue and try to see if uh, the tissue presses out or if there's um, an underlying mass there that we need to better characterize. We can also do magnification views when there are calcifications that we need to get a better look at. Um, we can do exaggerated views when we're trying to look at something really far um, on the inner breast or really far on the outer breast. And there are a, couple, and a number of other um, different views that we employ. And these images can be done in 2D or 3D technology. So I'm just gonna take a quick moment here to talk about breast density because I think it's really important. Um, radiologists classify breast density using a four level density scale. So if you look at these images here, when you're looking at a mammogram, the dark areas are fatty tissue and the white areas are uh, fibrous or glandular tissue. So if you are a breast density of A, on the far left here, it's an almost entirely fatty breast. Um, if you're a B, you have scattered areas of fibroglandular tissue. If you're a C, you're heterogeneously dense. And if you are a D, it means you have extremely dense breasts. So, why is that important? Well, we know that um, there is an increased risk of breast cancer um, with dense breasts. And also, it does make it harder for us as radiologists to spot a cancer within a dense breast. So you can imagine here, if you're looking at that extremely dense breast and you're trying to find a cancer, which appears as a white spot on a mammogram, it would be difficult to find in that dense breast tissue. 
And if you do have breast, uh, dense breasts, um, you are not alone. So 50% 50, 50 of women have some type of dense breast, so either heterogeneously dense breasts or extremely dense breasts. And I just think it's important for every woman to know their breast density. It's so important, in fact, that 38 states, including the state of Colorado, is required by law to um, send a letter, uh, you know, uh, basically sharing information with patients about their breast density after a mammogram. And it might mean that it would change, you know, the way we screen or the way that we um, uh, look at the breast if there are concerns, clinical concerns. So mammography is great, but it's not perfect, which is why we have other ways to look at the breast. And one of those is through ultrasound, which is basically using sound waves to produce images. And Ultrasound is great for determining the nature of a breast abnormality, trying to figure out if something is cystic or solid. You can also use um, a mode on the ultrasound called Doppler, which is used to assess um, blood supply to breast lesions. So I just put some representative images here. On the far left, you see this is what a benign cyst looks like on ultrasound. And on the far right, this is an irregular mass, um, and this is an invasive cancer. The one in the middle is... Um, pretty well circumscribed, but it doesn't look like the simple cyst on the left, and this would be probably a probably benign or a mildly suspicious mass. So at Boulder Community Health, we do offer screening whole breast ultrasound. Um, there are two types of whole breast ultrasound that are um, that are utilized within breast imaging. There's the handheld um, whole breast ultrasound, and there's something called ABIS, which is automated breast ultrasound. At Boulder Community Health, we have handheld um, ultra, whole breast ultrasound, which is performed by the technologist. These are ideally done at the same appointment as a screening mammogram, and it can find more uh, cancers than mammography alone in women, particularly with dense breasts. So this is just another way to look at the breast. Um, the benefits of uh, ultrasound is that no compression is involved and no radiation. But I just want to reiterate that um, whole breast screening is meant to be a supplement to annual mammography and not a replacement. And the next technology I want to talk about is contrast-enhanced breast MRI. So this is magnetic resonance imaging, and it uses magnetic fields to produce a very detailed um, cross-sectional image of the breast. So breast MRI is great as screening for high-risk women, as I discussed earlier. It's also great for staging known breast cancers, and it can be a great problem-solving tool. So say a woman has bloody nipple discharge, and we don't see a discrete mass um, by mammogram or by ultrasound. Bre breast MRI would be the next step. It's also um, a useful tool if, say, uh, you have an abnormal lymph node in your axilla, and it and it comes back on biopsy as a metastatic cancer, but we never found um, the actual primary tumor um, in the breast on the mammogram. Uh, breast MRI is great for that as well. There are a few drawbacks to breast MRI. For one, it is a little bit more invasive because it requires um, contrast intravenously. Gadolinium is what we use. Um, it does, because it is so sensitive, it can result in more false positive um, studies. So as you can see on that image on the bottom, the, the, um, the breast cancer is very obvious, but there are also a lot of other little bright foci, which um, you know, may be something to worry about um, or maybe just sort of background um, enhancement in the breast, and that's something that the, the radiologist is gonna be looking at carefully to decide. And also, breast MRI does tend to be expensive and not always covered by insurance. And I just want to take um, a moment to talk about screening um, exams during the COVID period. I just want to um, emphasize that it's keeping up with medical care is going to help ensure your health in the future. And so please um, don't delay cancer screenings. If you have concerns about scheduling exams, um, discuss with your provider, um, talk about your individual risks, and decide together when it's a safe time to return to, to screenings. And Boulder Community Health is um, employing a number of safety protocols to try to keep all the patients and all the staff safe. Um, women who are coming in for their scheduled mammograms are asked to wait in their car until the technologist calls them um, and they're ready to come in for their exam. 
Uh, everyone is screened at entry for symptoms. Uh, there's universal masking protocol, so all healthcare workers, patients, and visitors are wearing masks. We try our best to um, maintain physical distance in all the different workspaces and to minimize the time that you'll be spending in the waiting room. And we um, diligently are cleaning between patients and making sure all the rooms and equipment are decontaminated. So in summary, um, screening mammography is a proven lifesaver. It's a 40% reduction in breast cancer deaths with regular screenings. And most lives are going to be saved with annual screening at the age, starting at the age of 40. And please do not delay due to COVID. Second of all, please know your risk. High-risk patients will benefit from earlier screening and supplemental screening. So if you haven't had that conversation with your doctor yet or if you haven't had your risk calculated yet, please do so. And finally, um, I hope that everyone can just become familiar with the different imaging modalities and services offered at Boulder Community Health. It, it helps to know um, sort of what we're looking for when, when your provider is ordering different studies and you can kind of follow along on um, the diagnostic path as we, as we work up um, a clinical finding or a callback from a screening mammogram. And here are just some resources from a radiology point of view um, that you can check out. Um, there are some great uh, videos for patients, um, some uh, great articles and re further recommendations and guidelines. And thank you so much for all your attention, and we look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thank you so much um, for that presentation. And we do have some questions coming in from our viewers. Um, I'm going to start with this first one. Can caffeine impact breast tenderness? Can I answer? Yeah, yeah. sure, of course. Um, so yes, caffeine definitely can affect breast tenderness as well as the texture of your breast. So one of the things that I always um, let people know is if they have any concern when they're doing their self-assessment or self-breast exam, um, one of the first things that I always try to um, get the patients to do is to decrease caffeine consumption or avoid it um, altogether for a couple days because it can impact the texture. Um, and the sensitivity, so it definitely can cause some pain, um, and that's something that you could definitely um, talk to your provider about. All right. Um, this is kind of a two-part question. What causes breast density, and does your breast density change over time? So, yes. Um, in general, for most women, uh, breast density will uh, decrease with age, although um, there are many women, um, older women who still have quite dense breasts. So it, it's just um, every woman is different. So, but in general, breast density does decrease with age. Great. And this is a, another two-part question, probably for Paige, because it it's a, has your name in it. <laughs> um, it's, it says. Uh, if I wanted to uh, get a breast exam, who would I contact? Uh, how do I make an appointment with Paige? Great, well thank you so much. Um, I work for Foothills Community Midwives, which is a part of the uh, Boulder Community Health Network. And so you would, um, I think on some of the slides, there's a contact phone number and you would just call and ask to schedule a patient appointment. Um, for either a clinical breast exam, if there was a problem associated with it, you could let our office know that. Um, or if you just wanted to schedule your well woman exam, a clinical breast exam is included um, as a part of that. And Dr. Evans, I know you elaborated on this a bit, but for our viewers, um, uh, we had uh, uh, one of our viewers ask, um, is an MRI better than an ultrasound? So an MRI is going to be more sensitive than an, than an ultrasound, it's, and that, um, that can be very useful in finding small cancers um, or if you're looking um, for a very subtle finding. But the MRI also has limitations. Um, it won't necessarily find uh, DCIS, which is ductal carcinoma in situ, if it's um, a low-grade cancer. And um, ultrasound is 
really great for uh, characterizing a lesion and, and for lymph nodes as well. So each modality has its benefits and its drawbacks. Um, the one problem with MRI is that sometimes it's um, so sensitive that it, you know, as I discussed, it does create, um, tend to create a more false positives. Um, I think the important thing is to take all the imaging modalities and see how they work together to, to figure out, um, you know, to figure out what's going on. All right, we have a few more questions rolling in. I was told that if you have breast pain, it's not cancer, it's hormonal changes. Is this true? I have very uh, recurring pain in one breast, very dense. I didn't hear the beginning part. I'm sorry, can you report the, repeat no the problem. beginning? No problem, no problem. I was told that if you have breast pain, it's not cancer, it's hormonal changes. Is this true? I have recurring breast pain, it's very dense. I don't know that you could say that it is not cancer until it's been evaluated. So any changes, especially pain, I think is worth an evaluation and a dialogue with your provider and would probably warrant imaging. Um, not always is there something palpable or, f or f us, we're not able as providers to necessarily feel a lump or a mass or anything like that that might be associated with pain. Um, but if pain is there, then I think it's worth doing imaging um, to supplement our exam that we've done in the office to be sure that there's nothing that our fingers aren't feeling. I absolutely agree with Paige. Um, I think when there's a new change in the breast, it's always, um, uh, it always warrants an investigation and a conversation. And I've seen women present um, with breast cancer in a, a myriad of ways, um, not just by feeling a lump, but uh, just a different sensation in the nipple or focal breast pain. So yeah, these are all uh, symptoms that warrant a discussion and evaluation. And in terms of imaging, um, if you have focal breast pain or focal symptoms, um, or even generalized breast pain, um, that's considered a diagnostic workup. So you would get a diagnostic mammogram, and if you can uh, localize your pain, if, if it's um, focal to one area, we can do a targeted ultrasound in that area. And especially with if you have breast, uh, dense breast tissue, that might be uh, a good way to evaluate that area. How does breastfeeding impact breast cancer risk? Breastfeeding is one of the, one of the uh, lifestyle things that can actually decrease density. Um, I don't know the exact science behind it, and Dr. Evans might be able to supplement my answer on this, but because the density changes after you're done breastfeeding, um, definitely things are easier to be felt. Um, imaging is a little easier to be um, to detect something with less dense tissue, um, but it is definitely one of the things that decreases the risk. Yes, that that is um, what another positive for breastfeeding is that it is shown to have. Um, uh, to help decrease the risk of breast cancer, and it has to do with hormonal levels and changes. But um, I do want to just uh, say, if you are currently breastfeeding, um, that um, would not be a good time to get a mammogram, just because the, the, the breasts tend to be very, very dense during that time. But in general, yes, breastfeeding is, is a positive thing um, in terms of breast cancer risk. Would it be diligent to have serum estrogen levels checked regularly? I would not recommend serum estrogen level um, levels to be checked just as like a screening tool for breast cancer. Um, I think if there's other things going on with your history, that is a conversation that you can have with your provider to determine if hormone levels are needed to be checked. But in general, we do not recommend routine hormonal levels to be screened as a screening tool for breast cancer. What Excuse me, sorry. Does having a previous, oh, I'm so sorry. We're just getting a lot more questions then, and they're coming in quick. That's great. Hold on one moment. Does having a previous fibroadenoma uh, increase your chances of breast cancer? 
No, it does not. A fibroadenoma is a benign growth in the breast. Um, the only thing that um, we do look out for is um, there's something called a phyloides tumor, and that's basically um, a, a, a fibroadenoma that, that um, grows very rapidly and can be locally um, invasive. So, but no, there's no, there's no risk of a fibroadenoma becoming a cancer. That's not something that's been shown to be a concern. What are the possible signs of inflammatory breast cancer? Inflammatory breast cancer can have multiple different um, presentations. Um, one of the first things that I always want people to be aware of is skin changes. And so noticing a rash or um, dimpling of the skin, there's something that's referred to as puta orange, which is um, where, the pore, like, where the tissue changes and it becomes edematous and you can actually visualize the pores very easily on the breast tissue. Um, that, is, that can be one of the early signs. Um, and so mainly there's, there can be a variety of different presentations, but skin, skin changes are very important. Yes. Um, so oftentimes, if a woman comes in and she gets a biopsy with a um, diagnosis of an invasive cancer and she has skin changes, we will often recommend a breast MRI just to confirm that um, that cancer is involving the skin. Um, a lot of times you can tell clinically, as Paige was saying, with the, uh, the peau de orange um, appearance of the skin or other telltale factors. But if it's a subtle finding like redness of the skin or a subtle change in the skin, sometimes breast MRI can be helpful in determining whether um, there's an inflammatory element. All right. Can I schedule a mammogram with an ultrasound or does my provider need to approve the ultrasound? So I can take that one. Um, so if you are getting a screening mammogram, and remember I talked about the differences between screening and diagnostic studies. So if you are having no symptoms and it's just your annual screening, then um, the only way to, uh, to have an ultrasound is if you were getting a whole breast screening ultrasound in conjunction with your mammogram. For if you're having any type of symptoms, then that would be considered a diagnostic mammogram. And uh, many times your provider will put um, in the order, ultrasound at the discretion of the radiologist, meaning if the radiologist sees the mammogram and sees something that, um, that requires further investigation with ultrasound, then, then it's okay to do so. And that's usually how we uh, schedule those diagnostic studies. Why does alcohol increase the risk of breast cancer? Oh, I, I don't have, yeah, I don't have a scientific um, reason for you, but um, it's, it's one of just one of the known risk factors that it's associated. Yeah. And I, I think I'll just add a little bit. I don't think alcohol consumption does. I think it's excessive alcohol consumption, just because anything in an excessive amount is generally not good for our bodies, and so. Um, that goes back to like just thinking about like healthy lifestyle changes and habits and making sure we're exercising and um, you know when I when we mention exercise that doesn't mean you have to be an extreme athlete it just means like making sure that activity is included in your everyday life and so um, I don't think some alcohol consumption would increase your risk I think it would be excessive alcohol. Great. I'm a 59 year old female with no symptoms recently learned that my m birth mother had breast cancer. I don't know the details. Should I get an MRI or ultrasound? So um, as I um, discussed in my uh, presentation, I think it's very important that at this point she get um, a formal risk assessment. So that means having your risk calculated by one of the um, risk assessment tools that we talked about. Um, Paige uh, put a link in her presentation to one, I think that is by the National Cancer Institute. It's called, it's the Gale model. And um, there's the one that I spoke about in my presentation, the Tyra Cusig assessment score. So you should be working with your provider and um, sharing all the information that you have available 
available about your personal history and your family history, um, as well as the other risk factors, and getting a calculated risk assessment score. And from there, um, you can talk with your provider about what the next step is for uh, tailoring your screening to your risk. Um, does breast screening cause cancer? So, breast, um, so with any type of uh, x-ray study, there is um, a little bit of radiation that you receive with that um, because it's done with x-rays. But mammograms are done with um, very low dose x-rays and multiple studies have shown that um, the, the benefits of screening mammogram of, um, far outweigh the very small risk of any type of breast cancer from, from those mammograms. Can you please discuss the difference between DCIS and lobular cancer? Lobular? lobular. Oh, sure. So, so um, DCIS is ductal carcinoma in situ, and that's basically a stage zero cancer or a precancer. And that's when you have um, abnormal cells which are um, still within the milk ducts. So basically, you have abnormal cancer cells within the milk ducts, but they haven't invaded the tissue yet. So once they invade the tissue, that becomes invasive ductal carcinoma. Now, lobular carcinoma is um, a cancer of the lobules, the milk lobules, which are basically the collecting systems. Um, the milk travels from the ducts to the lobules. So it's just a different um, part of the breast. Do you recommend gene testing if there's a strong family history of breast cancer? Yes. Um, I think it is a great conversation. It's hard to say if I would recommend it without knowing um, a person's full history and personal history, family history, their age. Um, and so I think there are definitely times that warrant the hereditary cancer screenings. And I think that's a great conversation that you should have with your provider to determine what the next step is uh, that is right for you. My last breast exam had calcification. The gynecologist didn't look concerned, but there was calcification. Should I be concerned? Um, so I'm assuming you mean um, calcifications that were seen on a screening mammogram? Okay, so, so calcifications um, can be normal in a breast, um, and they can be associated with fibrocystic breast d disease. Um, calcifications are common with fibrocystic breasts. But what we're looking for when we, um, when we call back um, calcifications on a screening mammogram is uh, ductal carcinoma in situ, which I just talked about, which is basically a precancer. Um, it often presents as a new calcifications or a cluster of calcifications. So that's what we're, we're trying to find when we um, call back those calcifications on screening mammogram. So what we do when we're looking at your screening exams is we're comparing those calcifications, seeing if they're stable compared to prior mammograms, seeing if there's a new group that looks particularly suspicious or if the calcifications themselves have a suspicious appearance. There are certain features that we look for that, um, that make us more or less suspicious. Also, we look at the distribution of the calcifications and that can also be helpful in, in determining whether calcifications are benign or not. Okay, that's great. I think we're just moving to the end of our Q&A. Mm -hmm. So I have one more question. I think this is gonna be for Paige. Um, can a midwife do all the GYN screening that a OBGYN does? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, certified nurse midwives are providers that provide comprehensive women's health care. So that does include well woman exams, um, birth control, clinical breast exams to focus on today's presentation. Um, but a midwife is not a surgeon, so we're not a physician. Um, and so there are services that we do not provide um, that are out of our scope. Um, I think that if, it's, if seeing a midwife is something that you're interested in, um, I think it's worth a phone call to the office and we'd be happy to talk with you about what service you're looking for and if that's something we would be able to offer in our office. Um, but no, that is a great question because we, there's a lot of services that are um, 
done in both practices, a midwife practice as well as an OB. Um, but there are things that um, an obstetrician offers that we do not. So it's definitely worth a phone call to make sure that you're getting the best care that you need for whatever situation you have going on. And we've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org slash livestream. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email tomorrow. Please take a moment to fill this out, and I want to thank both of our speakers this evening. Thank you so much.